This is going to be a short two-part video series on most of the different types of sword used during the 80 years war. In the first video I'm going to talk about the first half of the war, uh, 1568 till 1600. In the second video I'm going to talk about the second half of the war, 1600 till uh, 1648. This also uh, overlaps with, uh, with the 30 year war. So a lot of swords that you will see in this video in the second video will also uh, count for uh, the 30 years war period. I will only mention swords that were used by the Dutch. So for instance, uh, I will not be mentioning uh, Eastern European swords, even though there were Eastern European mercenaries uh, who fought in the, in the 80 years war and in the 30 years war. In the 16th and 17th century, they were far less concerned uh, with typology than we are today. A lot of the classifications for swords we know today uh, come from the 19th and 20th century. For instance, uh, in modern Dutch, the word uh, degen refers to an Olympic-style fencing epee. While in the period, uh, the, word, the word degen uh, could refer to almost any sword with an emphasis on the thrust. For instance, these words can all mean the same thing in the 17th century. Even though all these terms can be confusing, I will try to give an idea of the uh, variety of swords and terms used in the period. Uh, these are just uh, the terms I'm using today. Uh, I really don't mind what, which kind of terminology you use. Um, you can, yeah, if you use mine, if you use someone else's or your own, uh, whatever works for you. I greatly underestimated how convoluted this topic was going to get before, uh, before I started my research and during my research. Uh, but all my sources will be in the description below this video. In this period, we see a greater variation uh, within the different types of swords. Uh, this has to do that the military wasn't as standardized as it became in the 17th century. Uh, but still, most military swords uh, were relatively, relatively simple with some hilt and uh, Blade variations. The long sword is a relatively long sword used in two hands. Uh, it can be used in one hand, but I've never met anyone who would prefer to use a long sword in one hand instead of two. Uh, they're straight bladed and double edged, and they were still used by some mercenaries in the early to mid uh, 16th century. But they started to fade away from the battlefield within the 16th century, and in the second half of the 16th century, you, you almost never, never ever see a long sword on the battlefield. Uh, you sometimes see them with uh, poorer people in the second half of the 16th century, but they were still used within a sporting context uh, in fencing schools or fechtschule. Uh, but then in the form of fetishway, uh, there were surviving examples of uh, feather swords. Uh, but we also see them a lot in fighting manuals. Uh, and the, in this context, they were used well into the 18th century. And there is a painting by Sebastian Vangs uh, depicting a man uh, wielding a long sword on a 17th century battlefield. But I don't know if this is supposed to be allegorical or uh, if he's supposed to depict some kind of uh, hero or anything. Uh, so I don't see this as valid evidence for uh, the long sword actually being used in the 17th century on the battlefield. Like long swords, armed swords are rendered from the Middle Ages, but within this period we still see a lot of swords that we could classify as arming swords. Now what do I mean uh, when I say that we could classify these as arming swords? Uh, I mean uh, a straight blade, a straight bladed sword, uh, that can be wielded in one hand with relatively uh, simple guard uh, that can possess side rings. Long swords and arming swords were also used heavily allegorically uh, as a sign of might, strength, and righteousness. Uh, and they're also the most recognizable type of swords uh, to draw or paint. I did find a 17th century image uh, with someone from the lower classes uh, who has a simple arming sword that looks very medieval. 
The hill design of an arming sword is so simple, just adding uh, a bar or two or a side ring can make it, uh, it can make it fall in a totally different classification. The Katzbarliger is typically known as a relatively short, straight-bladed infantry sword uh, with a characteristic uh, S-shaped guard, famously used by the Landsknecht, many of whom uh, came from, uh, from the Low Countries, especially within uh, the Diocese of Liege, or uh, as I know it, uh, Bisdom Luik, which encapsulates uh, a big part of what is now Belgium and uh, the south of the Netherlands. In the middle of the 16th century, uh, they start adding extra bars to Katzbalgers, sometimes effectively making them into basket-hilded swords, like this one in the Amsterdam Rijksmuseum, though it has a very thin, uh, stabby blade, so it can also be called a degen, which is not common for Katzbalgers. Katzbalgers often had tools stored in the side of the scabbard. There, is an, uh, there was an archaeological find in Eindhoven of a Katzbalger uh, complete with scabbard and set of five tools that could be stored in the scabbard. These tools included a tweezer, a handrail, a, a chisel or screwdriver, a knife, and surprisingly a fork, a really tiny small fork. The Katzbalika sword slowly disappears in the second half of the 16th century, together with the Landsknecht. Uh, and we don't see any type of sword that looks anything like the Katzbalager in the 17th century. Or at least, I haven't found it. The Messer, or Grosse Messer, which just means large knife, is a sword-like object um, with a single edge, sometimes curved, sometimes straight, sometimes with a very short back edge, of which the grip is often uh, constructed in the same way that a knife could be, with a protective lug or nagel riveted uh, into the guard. These nagels can have the shape of either just a bar, or a plate, or a ring, or even a shell. This bangwe has a very similar construction to that of a messer. Uh, the only difference being uh, that the bangwe does not, ha not have a pronounced guard, and most messers do. Uh, but here you can also see uh, the nagel and how it's been riveted into, uh, yeah, into the knife. In the second half of the 16th century, uh, a lot of messers had knuckle bows, and they were often only used uh, by people of the lower classes, since they had got out of fashion uh, for, uh, for yeah, the higher classes in the early 16th century. I've only found one uh, image of, uh, of a messer being used in a military context in the second half of the 16th century, uh, and then it's only by an engineer. There are just a handful of images that feature a Kriegsmesser, or a war knife in English. Uh, which is basically a larger version, version of the Messer that's used in two hands. And I could find uh, no historical information about when, how and where they were actually used. They have been very popular on the internet with sword enthusiasts uh, for the last few years as a sort of European comparison to the Katana. Which is interesting, uh, though, that a few of the images that I have found of Kriegsmessers within the Netherlands uh, also have the S-shaped guard that's characteristic for uh, the Katzbalger, which we sometimes also see on some types of two-handed sword or Biedenhander. And I've only found one Dutch 17th century image uh, that depicts a Kriegsmesser. Slagswaard, Zweihander or Bietenhander uh, were very large swords, always above uh, one and a half meters, often reaching to the chin uh, or nose of the, of the user or even higher. They were always straight, sometimes with a wavy blade, which nowadays we refer to as uh, Flamberge. They're also characterized by their ornate guards, 
which can also have the shape uh, similar to that of the Katwalge, but larger. Uh, and they should not be confused with the Montante or Spadone, which are Spanish and Italian. And their dimensions and context of use uh, and use in general are different than that of uh, the German or Dutch uh, Zweihanders. Men carrying these swords are often referred to as double soldiers, which alludes to them receiving double pay. Uh, but they were not the only ones. Uh, Halberdiers uh, and pikemen with uh, full equipped pikemen's armor, which uh, in this case means tassets, breast and back plates, and uh, spoilers on the arms, also were considered double soldiers and also received double pay. Same as uh, soldiers from noble birth. Men carrying these swords were often used as bodyguards for officers or to protect the ensign or, or flag bearer. They were also used within uh, infantry formations uh, to protect uh, the rest of the block uh, when the enemy threatened to get past the pikes, uh, the pike points. And then uh, the men carrying beaten hunters uh, would fight alongside men carrying uh, halberds and half pikes. And in the beginning of the, seven, of the 16th century, also murder axes, or mort axe. And together, these groups of uh, halberdiers, uh, men of Zweihanders, half pikes, and mort axes were called trabant. Uh, it's estimated that between uh, 1572 and 1593, about 3% of uh, men within a Dutch uh, infantry company uh, would be equipped with either halberds. Uh, or Slagswerden, or Zweihanders. In the second half of the 16th century, the, the Dutch used these swords less and less. By 1695, uh, there were no Zweihanders anymore being used by the Dutch on the battlefield. There were also very similar swords used as bearing swords or processional swords. Uh, these swords often look really ornate and impressive, uh, but were not meant for actual combat. They are often used by important people, by the bodyguards of important people, uh, or by guilds, just uh, to make their processions uh, more impressive to the public. talking about the typical rapier as it's seen today. I'm talking about a straight bladed sword with a relatively thin blade uh, with a, a developed hilt uh, in w with which uh, it's possible to place one or multiple fingers over the guard so that the, uh, so that the blade comes more in line with the forearm and it's easier uh, to aim your thrusts at your opponent. They originate in the uh, 15th and early 16th century in Italy and the Iberian Peninsula, uh, where they quickly uh, became a fashionable item for the higher classes. Uh, we, see, we often see uh, people on, on portraits wearing, uh, wearing rapiers, uh, where they often symbolize uh, military might and status. What we today would call a side sword lies somewhere in the middle between a rap rapier and an arming sword. Uh, the blades of side swords are often a little bit wider than that of a typical rapier and are also often a little bit shorter, but they still possess side rings uh, to protect uh, the fingers when you wrap them uh, around the ricasso of the blade. Uh, but the term side sword is a 19th, uh, 19th century invention and was not actually used in the period. The rapier remained popular uh, within the Low Countries well into the 17th century, about mid-centuries when, uh, when it disappears, uh, and they could have m a multitude of different hilt constructions and styles. I call this type of sword the Germanic rapier, since they differ from the typical rapier, but uh, most period sources refer to these swords as rapiers, uh, not to be confused with uh, German styles of rapier, like what today we would call the Peppenheimer. This is a sword that develops uh, in, the, in the early 16th century and remains popular into the 17th century in the Low and Germanic countries. They have a medium-ish length with some hand protection 
they differ from the typical rapier uh, in, the, in the fact that they don't have protection in front of the ricasso, so you can't wrap your fingers around the guard. Some hilt constructions also make this impossible, and the blades are always straight. These types of swords have a lot of overlap into the 17th century, and a lot of overlap with the later 17th century field swords. Basket hilt swords could be straight or curved, single or double edged, but they always uh, had a high amount of hand protection. The hilt styles could vary wildly. Uh, most popular in this period within the Low Countries uh, were the Germanic styles, but some more exotic styles uh, like this uh, Phoenician Schiavona could very rarely uh, also be found. In general, basket hilt swords went out of fashion in the Netherlands at the end of the 16th century but some blades and hilts were repurposed in the 17th century. Uh, some basket hilt swords remained into the 17th century, although they were very rare. A houdegen is an other hard to define sword, uh, since most sources from the period refer to almost any type of sword with an emphasis on the cut as a houdegen. It doesn't matter if it's straight bladed, uh, curved, single or double edged, uh, or what the hilt construction is. Uh, many, uh, many of the basket hilted swords could be referred to as a houdegen. Sometimes you'll come across the term Sinclair hilted sword. Most historians uh, see this term as outdated since it derives from the 19th century and doesn't really have any good historical basis. Some of these swords can also fall under the category of Dusak, however you want to pronounce or spell it. Uh, but this word comes from uh, Eastern European countries and some Germanic countries. Dusak is also the name used for the training sword uh, that they used in the period in the fighting schools uh, for the practice for fighting with a short cut and thrust sword. These training swords uh, were used from the 16th century well into the 18th century. Very simple houdings were often used by farmers or people from the lower classes. In the military some officers used curved swords, but officers can always just pick every kind of sword they personally like. But for most soldiers, straight swords were the, nor were the norm. If they were Houdegens uh, or uh, Germanic Rapiers or any other type, cavalrymen would be equipped with Houdegens. Uh, most of them would be straight, some of them curved. Uh, some of these cavalry swords would later be uh, repurposed on Dutch ships. More of that in our next video. They would also be used by Rondasiers, infantry soldiers or bodyguards armed, armed with a shield and a sword. And also by engineers, sappers and gunners. If you have any questions or anything to add, or did I forget to mention a particular sword? Uh, was there a sword that should have been on this list that wasn't? Uh, please leave it in the comments below and I'll see you in the next video.